My name is Chris Hall. I'm the program coordinator for Interprofessional Education Collaborative. We are a uh, collaborative of faculty from all the clinical colleges who work together to find opportunities to bring you together as f future practitioners to learn uh, how to work in teams when you get out in the world. We're glad to have you here. I'd like to introduce uh, Kate Lucas from the Occupational Therapy Program, and she's going to introduce our speaker for the day. Thank you so much. So I'm very happy today to introduce an educator, practitioner, humanitarian, and global citizen, Dr. Saeed Nafai. Dr. Nafai is a professor of occupational therapy at the American International College in Springfield, Massachusetts. He was born and raised in Morocco. He experienced direct contact with disability as his younger brother is handicapped. After studying law in Morocco and language in Europe and eventually emigrating to the United States of America, Saeed chose to become an occupational therapist after a job where he learned to work with children and adults in a world-renowned school for people with autism. He earned his associate degree in OT from, I'm not going to be able to pronounce this. Quinsigamond uh, Community College. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> his master's degree in OT from Salem State University and his doctoral degree from Boston University. He strives to improve the lives of people with disabilities and works in several rehabilitation hospitals and centers, providing direct rehabilitation intervention. Saeed is an expert in disability and physical rehabilitation, and he is known for his lively sense of humor, which you will see, and the ability to speak four languages fluently. Not to mention that he can carry on a conversation of, in a few other languages, which helps him have a sincere communication with uh, patients of diverse backgrounds. He is currently serving on the board of Massachusetts Association of Occupational Therapy. He has presented about rehabilitation at the state, national, and international levels. He is the founder of OT Morocco, which aims to bring OT to Morocco and improve access to rehabilitation there. Dr. Nafai volunteers his expertise nationally and internationally to improve the lives of others. So I'm very pleased today to introduce our friend and colleague, Dr. Saeed Nafai. Thank you very much uh, for this exciting opportunity uh, to meet all of you. And uh, first I would like to start with, uh, uh, you must be special and great people to be here attending a maybe a, a title that doesn't mean a lot to many people. And the second thing, studying something related to healthcare to uh, improve the life of many, and not just the life of the clients, but also the lives of their family members and the, the caregivers as well. So I will start with that. Second, uh, uh, UNE has a special place in my heart. Uh, in 2014, I was uh, hired uh, as an adjunct professor to go and teach for a semester in UNE Morocco. And uh, so it was a great experience as well. So if uh, you had the chance to go there, try it uh, to go and maybe just a visit. It's a great place. Um, so the topic is, uh, as you see, how consideration, how to uh, work with people who have uh, yes, uh, Muslim faith or even uh, to treat them or being a, having a colleague that has this uh, faith. So these are some of the object ob objectives we will see. It's working in a while. Oh, here it is. All right. So try to increase awareness, sensitivity, and appreciation of the Muslim culture. Second, build cultural fluidity, cultural humility, and dispel any stereotype in working with Muslims, and uh, increase knowledge of daily routine, habits, rituals, uh, of, and roles of Muslim people, and also understand the variations of values and rituals within the Muslim culture. And lastly, is relate how daily occupations uh, and occupational therapy will meet the cultural need of Muslim uh, patients and interprofessional practitioner. So I will start with one question. How many people here had any contact, maybe they know somebody or that they have a Muslim faith? 
that's great. All right, so, and for those of you who didn't, now we are, I'm a Muslim. <laughs> All right, so what is Islam? So Islam, Islam is a monotheistic faith, and uh, it's a part of the Abrahamic, uh, Abrahamic faith, so Judaism and Christianity and Islam, all of them, they believe in the monotheism and only one God. And um, it was revealed to Prophet Muhammad over 1400 years ago in what is now in Saudi Arabia. And uh, so a person who follow, a person who follow the Islamic religion or Islam, it's called a Muslim, okay? Um, so I know some people call it Muslim, so, but some people don't like that term because it's a Muslim, not a Muslim. So I just wanna bring this to your attention. And uh, the word of, for God in Arabic is Allah. And uh, in Morocco, we have some uh, Jewish population and they speak Arabic and they call God Allah as well. So Allah, it doesn't mean it's like some, but it's the word in Arabic, it's for God. Okay, so Christian uh, in Lebanon, for example, who speak Arabic or in Iraq or, or some other countries also say Allah, okay, so, because this is the word for God in Arabic. And um, the Islam holy book ca called Al-Quran, as we know as the Quran, and uh, the Prophet Muhammad is considered the final prophet after he uh, came after Jesus. Um, and <clears throat> Muslims believe in the, all prophets, so all Muslims believe the, in Jesus, in Abraham, in Moses, in Noah, in, so, and the same as they believe in Muhammad, so it's the, all, all the same. And uh, two major Islamic holidays that we have, one actually we will celebrate either Tuesday or Wednesday, and this is the confusing part I will talk about in uh, one of the slides. So it comes right after Ramadan. So right now, we are fasting the month of Ramadan, and this is the month that you fast from early dawn, like currently is 3.30 a.m., and then we break the fast at 8.30 p.m. So it's uh, about 17 hours, and then no water, no food, uh, uh, nothing can go uh, past your throat, to your stomach. <coughs> So, so where do Muslims exist right now? So it's almost every region in the world, there are Muslims. So it's almost 25% of the population in the world. So one of four people in the world is a Muslim. So the majority of, uh, of them exist, like uh, this is a, for example, Indonesia has the highest Muslim population and is uh, about 203 million and uh, Pakistan, 174 million, India, 161 million, Bangladesh, Egypt, Nigeria, and it goes on and on, and, um, and the, how much the percentage inside, how much, uh, so for example, Morocco, about 33 million, or something like that, so now it's like about 32 million uh, Muslims in the world. In America, there's some conflicting statistics. There are some people who say, about three million Muslims in America, like about 1%. And then there's some, that's, they say, oh, 1% oh, is only the practicing Muslims. But there is like, uh, some people say maybe seven to eight million, or if, if not more, of Muslims. So, in order to be a Muslim, you have to have those pillars. <clears throat> so pillars of Islam, like the first one is to have the declaration of faith and then praying five times a day, giving money to charity, like two and a half percent of your wealth every year, and then decide to give in charity another time, but two and a half percent is a mandatory a year. Fasting Ramadan, which we are doing right now, and then pilgrimage to Mecca, it's only if you have the means to do it, and you have to do it once in your lifetime. And then pillars of faith, you have to have them also to be a believer, to be counted as a believer in Islamic faith. So you have to believe in the oneness of God and also believe in angels 
in the holy books, not the, just the Quran, you have to believe in the Torah and the Bible, and others uh, that was sent to a prophet, and believe in the prophet, <clears throat> and also believe in the day of judgment. And lastly, is that everything that uh, it has pre, uh, like, uh, ordained by God. So you have to believe uh, that, uh, you know, predestination, that, uh, for example, if, uh, if something happened to you, this is something that God, you know, has some wisdom behind it. So, you, you know, so not supposed to get angry, you're not supposed to, and uh, so it's like predestination, the good or bad. <clears throat> so, in America, Islam has a, a way, so a lot of people may think, oh, maybe just like lately Muslims start coming here to Morocco, uh, to America, but uh, actually it's since the 15th century that America has contacts with Muslims and, yeah, and, uh, and Islam. So, and uh, President Obama, he went to Cairo in 2009, and uh, he said Islam is part of America. And also, this is a lot of people don't know that, and it's uh, actually I'm proud of it because I'm Moroccan. Uh, you, uh, you know, uh, the Morocco was the first country in 19, uh, 1777 to recognize the independence of this country, of the United States. So a Muslim Arab country was the first one before France, before anybody else. And uh, I got the chance when I went to Tangier, there is actually a letter from George Washington thanking the Moroccan government for being the first country to recognize the independence of the United States. And uh, also, there is a letter who uh, shows uh, thanking the Moroccan government for protecting American ships that used to go to the Mediterranean. So Morocco used to protect the United States ships traveling to the Medi through the Mediterranean. So there's a relationship between America and Muslim countries and, is, and, and, and other Muslims that goes way beyond like a, the existence, of, from the existence, early existence of this country. So Muslims in America date back, as I mentioned, um, also there is a, and ironically he happened to be Moroccan as well, there is a, a Muslim slave it's a called Mustafa Zamuri. If you get a chance, you can Google it later. You'll learn more about his, he was like a charismatic uh, person. He came in the 15th century, 1528 or something like that. And he, um, he's considered the discoverer of New Mexico. And uh, so through that discovery, the ships got drowned. And then uh, he was one of the four people who survived. So, and then they went, uh, they went Tampa, Florida, which is now Tampa, Florida. And um, after that, I mean, be between 15th century and the 19th century, Muslim kept coming. But in the 19th century, it was like a little bit increased and, um, from people in Middle East. And what we, in Arabic, we call it America. The United States or America, we call it America. Uh, So, as I mentioned before, the percentage of Muslims right now in America, so in the East, about 32% of Muslims are existing in the East United States, 25.3% uh, are in the South, and uh, Central and Great Lakes, about 24%, and the West, about 18.2%. And mainly, are like 34% of them are from South Asia, uh, 26% are Arabs, and 25% are African American, and 15% uh, are others. For example, people who converted to Islam, and I will talk about this in the next slides. <clears throat> this is video, I don't think we will have the time, but I will, if we have time, you can watch it at the end. It's a great video about uh, Muslims in America. So, <clears throat> your chance to have a colleague that have the Islamic faith, or a patient, or a, uh, a child of a Muslim family, it has been, is been increased. And the reason why, because Islam currently is the fastest religion in the world. 
All right. So 73% of them, uh, it, it's going to be increased by 73% between the, uh, 2010 and 2015. And those are other faith. This is how the percentage, 35 for Christianity, 34 Jews, Judaism, 16%, and the list goes on. So we are in the state of Maine, so I did a little bit of research about it. So the first group of Muslims in Maine arrived in the 19th century, and uh, they were actually an Albanian uh, group of people, and they were recruited by preparal uh, textile in Bedford. I don't know if it still exists. Does it still exist? Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. And uh, so there is a claim that their mosque in Bedford was the first one established in the United States. And this is the website that talks about it. So in the community of Albanians, Muslim, actually when I was reading also, uh, there is some uh, 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 a graveyard in Bedford, and if you go there, there is some stones that uh, has still uh, have some names of those people that died, uh, like in the 19, some of them like read the 1918, or so that's what the article was talking about. There is uh, show us what town they were born in, in Albania and all that stuff. So the community of Albanian Muslims was mostly wiped out by the Spanish influenza epidemic in 1918. Um, there is also about 6,000 Muslims currently now living in Maine. Majority of them refugees of Somalia, Iraq, Sudan, and Afghanistan. Beside, of course, other group like uh, that we talked about before. There are also eight mosques in Maine, four in Portland, two in Lewiston, one in Augusta, and one in uh, Orano. Are you safe? Okay. Orano, okay. And uh, you can, sorry, that's my, my Boston accent. <laughs> <laughs> you can visit a mosque regardless of your religion. Uh, so feel free to schedule a tour or drop in. And the reason why I said that is because sometimes if you are working with a, a lot of, uh, uh, for example, my wife, she's also an OT, so we're an OT family. And she, we're, we're in Worcester, we have a lot of population that uh, right now also refugees, like Iraqis and stuff. So, and uh, I mean, thank God my wife, uh, she knows about the culture and the religion and stuff. But if someone work with uh, majority of people that are Muslims and stuff, so it will be uh, good to go see where they worship or maybe at least if you have questions or if you have concern or if you have, maybe you want to ask for advice. So this is an area where you can start at the mosque or maybe they can guide you to somewhere else. And sometimes, like at the mosque where we are in Worcester, people just drop in, Worcester, Massachusetts, people just drop in or like they call and schedule a tour to learn about uh, the, you know, especially neighbors in the area and stuff. So 20% of American Muslims are converts. So a lot of time you may see someone, and that's my beautiful wife, Elizabeth. Uh, she's an OT, as I mentioned. And so this is, uh, sadly, this is the, funeral of Muhammad Ali uh, two weeks ago, three weeks ago. And so he was also a convert. <clears throat> so how other mainstream US religion view Islam? So in 1999, uh, Pope uh, John Paul II actually kissed the Quran as a sign of respect of the religion, of, uh, of the Islamic religion. So there is no, you know, all this, sometimes the media and the politics and stuff create like some hostile environments between religions and between people, but technically uh, people who know or people who maybe uh, have contacts, direct contact with Muslims or with Arabs or whatever, so there, there is no issues. So it's just people get sometimes uh, fired up with, with thing, things in the media and issues. So we'll talk about some of them. So this is some uh, like myth about Muslims, so I just said uh, good to know. So. A lot of people think that all Arabs are Muslims or all Muslims are Arabs, which is not true, okay? So uh, it's a mi small minority of people that they are uh, Arabs, okay, uh, in Islam. 
So the majority of the Radak in the United States died by non-Muslim. So a lot of people also say maybe that all that stuff is happening here, here, you know, so unfortunately. But when it happened by Muslims, you see it more in the media. And when it happened by non-Muslims, you don't hear about the, much or you don't hear about the religion of those population. So the, if you go to the FBI data, there is actually 94% of terrorist attacks in the United States are happened by non-Muslims. Okay? And that's where I got that chart. So, um, and also one of the things that actually Muslims are the biggest majority, the, major, the majority of terror attack in, in, uh, throughout the world. So and you can see what happened like uh, two days ago or yesterday in Turkey, in the airport. So guess what? Those people are Muslims, you know? So what happened in Somalia like three days, four days ago. So uh, it's, uh, it's, this is, uh, but unfortunately that does not, uh, talks about much in the media like Alex. So what Muslims in the United States fear? So the reason why I'm talking to you about this before we get to the clinical stuff, it's good to know what is population you will work with, you know, what is exactly how they feel and what's the, their faith. And so it's not an Islam one one class. <laughs> so like hate crimes after, for example, something happened. So like it showed in the media that, you know, that, uh, we, uh, this person get attacked or the whatever, or this terrorist attack, whatever, so that's what the backlash or whatever, people start feeling hate crimes, like discrimination, you know, we may see somebody, may see, I mean, we have, they have reports and uh, in some uh, 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 human rights organizations about people maybe, do you hear me guys? <laughs> okay, all right, so they may uh, like, uh, get start discriminated against just because they have a head scarf. Okay, and unfortunately it happened even to my wife. One time uh, she was uh, in, in a store something and then the lady told her, uh, go back to your country, just because she had the headscarf. And then my wife, she said, I'm from upstate New York. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So, uh, and uh, hate speech, like you hear people talking in the media and you all know about what's going on about uh, hate speech lately. Uh, physical assault, some people get, uh, hit, get, uh, so just because of, uh, you know. And uh, PTSD, a lot of people start, start afraid, you know. And, uh, and the reason why I mentioned in this is if, you're like, uh, you, the kids also hear things. I'll give you an example. My little daughter, she's nine years old, and she hears about uh, what Trump's saying in the media. And literally, she, sometimes she has like a, like a PTSD, she's coming in and telling us, are we gonna, like, are they gonna send us out of here? Bob, are they gonna send us out of here? And she's, you know, she's like, <laughs> she's American, you know? So, but the stuff that they hear outside uh, in school or with, so they get a little bit affecting them. So the, I'm mentioning this because if you work with children or if you work with parents of children who are hearing this, or if you know someone working, that can be also part of the problem to deal with health-wise, okay? And um, so assumption also that, oh, I'm one of them or one of few that, commit acts of terrorism against America that are considered extremists. Uh, always like, you know, it's always the people's background, or, you know, because the, the first thing you get, you get pointed to, or, you know, or why they do that? So uh, it's, not, it's not my fault, it's not so. So things uh, can a little bit get interpreted uh, the wrong way. So here's the fun stuff. <coughs> so Muslim cultures, so sometimes it is used broadly because again, we're talking about 1.6, 1.7 billion people. And uh, there is also different you know, traditions in the, in the country. So it's, sometimes it's hard to pin it down, but we'll try to do, uh, try to do my best. <coughs> so the other thing I would like to mention is there is two uh, version or two uh, mainstream of Islam. Sunni, which is the majority, which is like 90% almost, uh, and then we have the Shiite, which are mainly based in Iran, uh, some parts of Pakistan, and other, uh, Lebanon, what is the, the Shiite uh, uh, version. But again, it's, we still believe in the same God, we still do the same practice, but just like some small uh, little thing that they are not agreed on. So, Muslim cultures greetings. So you may always hear salam, which is like mean peace. And so uh, like salamu alaikum. And uh, I'm sure you heard this a lot, Kate in Morocco. <laughs> salamu alaikum. 
So this is how people uh, greet each other in the Islamic faith. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, and uh, like should Judaism close to, to, to Hebrew, like shalom, shalom alaikum. So it's kind of like close, assalamu alaikum. And um, so hand shaking. So follow your cue. Some Muslims are not comfortable shaking the hand with the opposite uh, sex. Some are comfortable with it. So you follow your cues. Sometimes you go, let's say you have a parent of a child or like some patient and you wanna, so if they put their hand first, then, because sometimes it's embarrassing, you put your hand to you, but to, uh, to them as well, because they feel uh, uh, that, but this is follow the cues. If they put their hand first, then you'll follow. Eye contact, like uh, as known as the shoulder gaze, uh, or do you have something on my chin? And the reason why I mentioned that is sometimes uh, and, uh, somebody very conservative, either a female or male, the opposite sex, they don't look at them directly in the eye. So they are either looking at their shoulder and they're talking, or they're looking at your chin. So like, they have something on my chin. <laughs> so, and then social distance versus medical treatment. So sometimes also a female and male don't like to be in the same area. So you may go to, you might not be surprised to go to a wedding or to a, 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 an invitation and you find the female sitting in one place and the male sitting in one place. Or you may find like a, a female lady, she may come and talk to you, but she's like leaving a lot of room between you and the male, uh, uh, even, even a co or co-worker or whatever. So this is, a, but medical treatment, it's okay. So some of them are okay with male giving, or if the opposite sex giving the medical treatment. Um, so Muslims do not bow to other people. So uh, for example, uh, as a communist tradition, so uh, uh, there, uh, because, and again, that goes back to the, we only bow to God. This is, so this is when you see, like even some sport, like uh, some Muslims who play, maybe uh, some sport they may not bow, so th that's because of their faith. This is, but some do, some, some majority don't. <clears throat> Muslim cultures and headscarf, which you call hijab, so, Islam encourages to dress modest, modestly, and uh, so Muslim women from the diverse background observe modesty in their own way. And so again, this is uh, something that came with the faith, but you may be also not surprised to go to Muslim countries and find that people, some of them are not wearing hijab, okay? Like for example, in Morocco, we have maybe 50-50% or 60-40%, 60 with a uh, headscarf and 40% with none. So, but uh, <clears throat> some of them, so this is my uh, oldest daughter, Safiya, and this is my little one, Mina. So this starts wearing it when they reach puberty, but the little one she's wearing, there was a holiday, so you may find the little kids also wearing a headscarf. Uh, the holiday or when they go into the mosque, for, so that doesn't mean they're gonna wear it every day. <clears throat> but in some countries, it's, some women may not be wanted to wear it, but because of the norm and because of uh, that, it's like, it's like uh, for them it's like just a tradition, so they have to wear it. But when you go outside that country, they may take it off. In the United States, it's kind of the like opposite. So people wear it because they are, want to wear it, okay? So they want to wear it. And uh, an example, also in France, people want to wear it, but unfortunately, for some uh, law that the, the government doesn't allow them to wear it. Uh, especially if you work for the government. So there's uh, uh, some uh, uh, issues around that as well. <clears throat> so Muslim food, it's, uh, we eat what is called halal, or so similar to what is in the Jewish tradition called kosher. And uh, so we don't eat pork, and also we don't drink alcohol. Uh, and because they, they are considered, you may hear somebody saying it's haram, which is like forbidden. So Muslims eat halal meat, which is meat that's uh, beef or chicken or goat or lamb, that are slaughtered in an Islamic way, okay? That's the same as the, the Judaism. Uh, so use of alcohol or gelatin products for medical uh, purposes is allowed but discouraged. So I mean, somebody gonna going to have a surgery and they're gonna die, and then they have to have a product to save their life, he's not gonna tell them, Oh, no, I don't want to have alcohol. No, it's okay. It's, it's, it's allowed. So, 
Muslim culture evolution. So like what we call in Arabic wudu. And this is a ritual washing in order to be considered clean before you perform, before a Muslim perform a salat or prayer. And so blood, urine, feces, all make Muslim and clean. So for prayer, they have to do a specific washing. And so don't be surprised to go and find your colleagues' feet in the sink. <laughs> so they are, they are part of a, so they have, they have to wash their hands, their face, their mouth, their nose, their, their little bit, their hair, their arm hair, and then the last one is the feet. Uh, so the water is not, if the water is not available, or Muslim is sick to get out of bed, they may use a rock to rub as a dry ablution. So this is, uh, you may, if you have a patient in the hospital and they are sick, if you see next to them a little stone or a little rock, that's why. Because then they can rub against uh, with it and then to perform the evolution. Okay, because this, this is, you only do this if you are sick or if there is no water. Okay? So prayer, it's called in Arabic salat. And um, it's meaning we, like it's a five segment that we do a day. So the first one, it's way early morning at 3.30 a.m. right now. So it goes with, it's kind of like goes back uh, when the day gets shortened, it goes back. So like in the winter, maybe like at 5.30, something like at 6 a.m. in the winter. But right now, because the, the day is very long, so it starts at 3.30 a.m. And that's where we break our fast, where we start our fast, sorry. And the second one is around noon, like 1.30. 1 and then the third one right now will be like around uh, 5 o'clock. And the third, uh, fourth one where we break our fast is 8.30. And then the last one is 10.15. So it's five times a day. And uh, it just involves some movement. Okay, so it's bending down and going up, putting your head, uh, your face down uh, on the ground. And it's, uh, and this is the reason if you like uh, see sometimes in prayer, why the man in the front and woman in the back, because it's involved movement and bending down and stuff. So for modesty and stuff, so women are stayed in the backs and then the man in the front. And uh, so it's, if you see somebody who goes in the office or whatever, you see somebody on the ground, they're not having a heart attack or something, they're just praying. Uh, one time I was in the library at Queen Sigmund Community College, like years ago, and I was praying between the shelves of the library, and then I was bending exactly like this, and the lady in the library came here, uh, to me and she said, oh, what book are you looking for? <laughs> 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 Can I help you? And then, you know, you are not supposed to talk. So I didn't talk to her, and I continued praying, and she's like, oh, I'm so sorry. And she's like, <laughs> going back. Yeah. So, and uh, this is, uh, uh, if somebody is sick, if you, that man, for example, he's handy, uh, with a, has a disability, so then he can pay, pray sitting. If somebody is even very, very sick, they can pray laying down in bed and pray only with their eye gaze. So this is, uh, it's meant to be, to do with, uh, based on your ability. <clears throat> and uh, the, like the, the, uh, right now, if I travel to Europe or I travel to another state, I want to know, or a Muslim want to know where is the, how, where the time to pray for that location. There is a, like islamicfinder.org, or also there's a lot of apps like prayer, and then it tells you exactly, because every place has its own time, based on the, again, based on the sunrise and sunset. <clears throat> So, and Muslims, they all pray toward Mecca, okay, in Saudi Arabia. So, Muslim patient prayer. So, again, if somebody is sick, as I mentioned, so remember, Muslim will not speak to you during when they are praying, okay? So, and this is, if you are trying to schedule a, a therapy treatment, whatever, so try to avoid prayer time which is like a fairly 10, short 10 to 15 minutes window, typically. And also Friday, it's uh, the holiday of Muslims. And you go pray between 12, uh, between one o'clock to 1.45 to two o'clock. So 
uh, try not to schedule in the group for Friday for somebody who is Muslim. I mean, if they are practicing, then they will not come to appointment. Okay. <clears throat> so in the home, Muslim cultures, majority of them, they leave shoes outside because they don't want to bring anything dirty inside, because especially in the area where they pray. And uh, removing shoes when entering Muslim is appreciated. But again, if there's an emergency, or like a fire or something, <coughs> of course, the people are okay to walk in uh, with, the, with their shoes. And um, in the hospital, like shoes is okay. If you go to somebody's hospital room, you know, it's, you know or a nursing home, whatever, yes, kind of like that's where they are right now. So it's okay to keep your shoes on. Because they're not considered home. So as I mentioned before, Friday is the day of worship for Muslims. And no prayer is co uh, communal uh, and includes a uh, sermon. So most Muslim, most Muslims feel, because it's a duty, and it's actually mentioned in the Quran, that you have to go to prayer on Friday. And um, the, the depending on access, uh, so try to schedule your clients or patients or whatever uh, around that. So holiday, there are two Islamic holidays, as I mentioned. There's one we, it's, we have, again, the reason why we don't know, it, it always every year, because it's, uh, so the first one is Eid al-Fitr. This is the end of Ramadan, the, the next day after the end of Ramadan. And um, because uh, we follow the lunar month, and some months are 29 days, some are 30 days, okay? So if you see the crescent, the, you observe the moon, so that means, okay, you observe it at night, so this means tomorrow is a holiday. So Tuesday, for example, will be 30 days in Ramadan. So Monday, we are, are going to observe for the moon. If it is a moon, then we are going to have the holiday on Tuesday. If there is not, then Wednesday is definite, the holiday. So this can be, uh, you know, if you work with a Muslim, or you have, or if you have a child uh, in a school or whatever, that they, they don't know, or they don't show up one day, or, or maybe two days, they took two days off, it's because of this. It can create a lot of confusion, like you want to ask for time off, or like a, your uh, co-worker, or your worker, or whatever. So this is why, because people don't know. A lot of, when I was working, in, uh, when I, um, I mean my main job now is teaching, but when I was working in, in, uh, in uh, rehab, full-time in the hospital, or a nursing home, I always take those two days off, just so, you know, it's like the, the whole three days or the whole week off. So just so, uh, like, uh, make it easier. And uh, Eid al-Adha, it's a, it's a sacrifice, and we celebrate the, the tradition of Abraham, Prophet Abraham, and then this is, comes like about 70 days after the first holiday. <clears throat> so to say to a Muslim, Happy Eid, or uh, we say, or Happy Holiday, we say Eid Mubarak, Eid Mubarak. This means Happy Eid. Uh, so, so it can be difficult for Muslims and non-Muslims alike to anticipate the exact day of the holiday, as I mentioned before, because uh, of the change of the time. So pets in the Islamic culture, so our, because uh, again, that, that doesn't mean because Muslims doesn't love a pet, but just because uh, they, are, they can be okay having outside the house, but not inside, except with cats. I mean, mainly dogs. Dogs are not allowed to be inside the house, to live with inside the house. So that can be uh, uh, because animal saliva considered unclean, so to avoid excessive cleaning and stuff, so dogs are not allowed inside the house. <clears throat> Um, in Western cultures where many pet owners consider them part of family, so the avoidance of being uh, can sometimes be considered as uh, for the second cause for offense, which is uh, where none is intended. So I just as you mentioned, it's not about Muslims don't like animals, no. It's just uh, they are, uh, again, for the reasons I mentioned before. And as I mentioned, cats are okay. Those lucky cats. Fasting and Ramadan, as I mentioned. So, Saum, which is Ramadan, fasting, called Saum. 
So I'm Muslim may fast or abstain from eating, drinking, smoking, any sexual relations, and exhibit extra behavioral self-control for a variety of reasons related to their faith. So the fast, as I mentioned, lasts from early dawn to sunset. So, and then Ramadan is the holy month in which Muslims fast every day. And then as sick person, as I mentioned, if you are sick or if you are traveling, if you are a child, again, only puberty, then you have to start fasting. But children are not allowed. Somebody who is sick, somebody who is traveling, a uh, pregnant woman, maybe that's can endanger the child, uh, and also women that they are, they are in menses, so they are not supposed to fast. <coughs> So again, if uh, uh, somebody who have like a, a insulin, they are sick or stuff, they are not, they take insulin, that can jeopardize, so they are not supposed to fast as well. Mm. But this is an area, actually it's good, to, good to, to mention, is that sometimes people, even though they have diabetes or they're sick, they try to, uh, like, a, like I wanna fast, I wanna so. Which is, not, which is not good, because the God that give you a lot, that asks you to fast is the same God that gives you the permission to not fast when you're sick. So we have a problem like this uh, in, in Morocco. A lot of time you hear somebody who has diabetes either died or like they have, they have and this is just a misinterpretation of the, of the, the religion or maybe the culture again, right? So it can be considered as, as technically homicide. For some scholars they say, we are not supposed to fast, but you fast and now you are, your health is in, 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 in danger. So it's not encouraged for people to do that. Uh, so body language, so sitting with soles of feet or shoes facing a person can be a, like a kind of uh, inappropriate. And uh, let me just show you one thing here. And, uh, Hi, I'm Sarah Foster, and I am an actress. Hi, I'm Erin Foster. I'm a writer and a model. You're not a model. Sorry, I, I don't, I don't own this company. Yeah, so. <laughs> Skip that. Yeah, there's. Prime Minister Erdogan. So watch, watch the body language of President Obama and the uh, President of uh, Turkey. <laughs> Uh, I'm glad that uh, I personally and the American people have a chance to reciprocate uh, the wonderful hospitality that was extended you to see me that? when I visited Turkey in Asia. Did you see it? So as soon as uh, President Obama crossed his feet and the shoes faced the president of Turkey, so he moved a little bit and then he gave him the same. So it's like a body language, like, you know? <laughs> so that can be, so this can be a little bit, but again, President Obama didn't mean anything about it, but just like, it's, it's, that's what how he interpreted the President of Turkey. <clears throat> so it just because it's appropriate for some Muslim to, to you know, uh, and if you remember, uh, like uh, uh, President Bush was like maybe, years ago was in Iraq and somebody threw shoes on him. And so uh, this is also be very, very, because the, the worst thing you can throw somebody on is the shoe. So it's very, uh, fine, like very, that's you are like, you don't, it's, if something means bad, you know? So that's mean like you don't hit somebody with shoes either. Uh, so this is, uh, you know, so you have to sit like mainly face to face and then try not to touch them with your feet either. So Islamic art, so draw, uh, drawing, any, drawing anything uh, sometimes can be considered like a, because uh, only God is, you know, that's creating things, but some, uh, some areas they say it's okay to take pictures, but it's not to draw anything, okay? So, but uh, some they say it's okay. So I'm telling you, like, uh, giving you many thoughts of some, how they interpret it. Some they say it's okay to, but maybe statues are not, are not okay, because they are creating, something that maybe uh, people kind of like start oh, kind of like worshiping, okay? Or maybe looking at that 
It's something that's me very highly, because this is how prophets came before to uh, m have people not worship idols, technically. So that's how it's from many, many years, it's not considered, uh, it's not encouraged for uh, making statues and stuff. But photography, it's okay. Uh, common Muslim cultures, so misinterpretation in the West is cultural practices that occur in some countries that are predominantly Muslim in faith. So this is, again, sometimes the culture can uh, clash with the religion, okay? Even though the religion doesn't say it or it's not allowing it, but it can be done in the culture. And then people can misinterpret it and think it's part of the religion, okay? And I put the perfect examples here. Like in Afghanistan, there is a woman, for example, are not allowed to work nor go to school, okay? However, the Prophet Muhammad, he used to work for his wife. So his wife was his boss. And then uh, he said, seek knowledge even in China, because China was then is the part of this place. So, but because some cultural thing in Afghanistan are not allowing women to go to school. So now they start uh, working on that. Women now are allowed to go to school and work. But there's still some regions they do not, uh, in Afghanistan are not allowed, they are not allowed. So, female genital mutilation, like in some sub-Sahara regions, so, uh, they also they do this practice, but it's, it's not in the, in the Islamic faith. It's a cultural thing. But uh, even Ethiopia, like it's a majority Christian Muslims, okay, Christian uh, country, and they have this uh, practice as well. <clears throat> so honor killing, so it's a, so a woman, for example, get raped by somebody, and then the family go and kill her because she brought shame to the family. So it's not her fault. And again, it's nothing has to do with religion, but just a culture, it's a culture thing. But sometimes can people say, oh, it's, it's in the religion, it's not. And also, uh, restrictive driving. So if you plan to go to Saudi Arabia for any reason, and you're a woman, you won't be able to drive, okay? Uh, so women there, they're not, for some reasons, the government are not allowing them to drive. And, uh, but uh, it's funny, they show, uh, they show the la Muslim lady from Indonesia or, or Malaysia, they are flying an airplane, yeah, she's a pilot. So she's in Saudi Arabia, flying an airplane in the airport, but she cannot drive outside the airport a car. <laughs> so, and she's a Muslim. So, just because of the restrictions. <clears throat> so this is a Muslims and illness. <clears throat> so during an illness, Muslims are expected to seek God's help with patience and prayer. And actually, some, some uh, like uh, they are considered as a test from God, and so they have to, uh, like testing your patience, and so they will, they will increase the remembrance of God. They may pray more. They may start like doing more good deeds and stuff, and uh, ask for forgiveness. And then they, they may start reading and listening to the Quran. So the reason why I mention that is sometimes if you work in a hospital, you may find like a loud uh, recitation of the Quran, and that's why because for some reason they start more, uh, more uh, spiritual. And also, they believe in dying, that dying is part of living, and this is an entrance to the next life. <clears throat> so because the Quran says, uh, to God we belong, and to him is our return. So blood transfusion in Islam is allowed, and abortion for the sake of the mother's life, it's allowed. And uh, Maintaining a terminal patient and artificial life is uh, uh, not allowed or is uh, uh, discouraged. Uh, in the, it is an Islamic culture and religious practice to visit the sick home or in the hospital. So if you are in the hospital and you have a sick patient, you may find sometimes 20 people in the room. Okay? And that's uh, happened to me when, I, when I'm working in the hospital. If you have a Muslim patient, I found a lot of people. But it's just because it's not, it's part of their faith to visit the sick person. You got reward for it. That's how it's in, uh, mentioned in Islam. But it's okay to educate them because I had, for example, a patient who has cancer and very sick. And the room, it 20 in, uh, five back, in 10. So the whole day visitors. So, so I had a meeting with the, the family member and I mentioned to them, with social worker and I, and then the family member, patient needs some rest. They are very sick. 
they need sleep, they need to have some rest. So the family member would talk to her and she'd like, you know, put a, uh, outside a list, please no visit for today or maybe like a no visit until whatever day. So she kept changing this and uh, so because, uh, and I think also you may find this in other cultures as well. I remember I had a Portuguese uh, patient and the same thing, we had like so many people coming in and out, in and out, in and out. <coughs> So also Islam does not ban treatment by the opposite gender. So some patients may insist on having the same gender clinician uh, out of, uh, just for comfort. So a Muslim may not speak English, so use an official interpreter and avoid using family interpreter. Uh, interpretation is uh, like in asking some sensitive personal. So this is my own personal experience. I went with my mom, like a, so maybe 10 years ago, uh, 11 years ago here in, in Worcester. And uh, uh, she was maybe like uh, 48 then or like 49. And then she asked me, the, the doctor, does your mom still have her menses? That's, and like for me, I wanna die. <laughs> 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 like I, can, I cannot ask my mom this question, you know. I couldn't, and like I didn't ask her. Like I said, like, I, know, I said, you know what? I can, uh, like, uh, in, next time she come have an interpreter and ask her, but I can't ask her this question. <laughs> Just, you know, this is how I, I couldn't, I couldn't, because my, my mom, my, uh, somebody else I will, but I couldn't face my mom and ask her this question. <laughs> and my father have, uh, uh, just like a, a month ago, had a surgery, prostate surgery, so I have to interpret him, and then the doctor asking me if he's still having sex. And I couldn't ask him either. <laughs> so, so this is, you know, so the reason why I mentioned this is if you are trying to ask, you know, for example, if you work with people, we, as OTs, we address also sex, you know, positioning and stuff for people with spinal cord injuries, with people with arthritis. With, so if you ask, if you, uh, if you are, you have to be aware of their culture and religion, okay? So if you know somebody a Muslim or they are very conservative, don't ask the family member, have an interpreter, okay? So, if possible, as I mentioned before, establish a relationship with the, uh, with the center, Islamic center in your town, so or a chaplain, or what we call imam, so it's the head of the mosque, or like the, what is similar to what the priest or a rabbi. Uh, or identify one or more Muslims in your team, so to, to help with any uh, rising issues that uh, maybe or can be a liaison between you and patient Muslims. So spirituality is redefined. This is actually was addressed in our OT practice. How many OTs here? Oh, big number. Okay. So in 2014, our OTPF occupational therapy practice uh, framework it was uh, add to its spirituality, and it's we have to address that as well. So it allows a sense of connecting, uh, connectedness to something larger than oneself or that are especially meaningful in their life. And also the centennial vision, also uh, our professional goals to be a globally connected and diverse workforce. So we may work with people with the Islamic faith or also we may work with patients with the Muslim faith. So this goal should include sensitivity to the religious and spiritual rituals of the future of our profession. So, so if you have a coworker who is Muslim, so do not interpret, speak, as I mentioned before, while they are praying. So work-based prayer uh, usually lasts about seven to 10 minutes. And so they may pray only twice during the, uh, their work shift. So they may work, uh, pray at noon, and then uh, if at the winter, they may pray around 2.30 or 3 o'clock. But like now, they may pray only one. When the long day is long, they may pray only once during the, at noon. It is more respectful to refrain from distractions, like music or like loud thing while they are praying. So a Muslim coworker is uncomfortable with the after hours pub night. And the reason why, because we, they may not, uh, because of the alcohol thing. So um, a Muslim coworker may come out to eat at a restaurant with the work crowd. So if you can sit at a slightly separate table, then some of them you may not want to sit in a place, in a table that has alcohol. So they may sit in a separate table without alcohol. 
So a Muslim coworker may feel awkward during the holiday season and not certain, you know, uh, they may do that uh, exchange of gifts in the holiday. So because they don't celebrate Christmas, so they don't want to be part of it because they don't celebrate Christmas. <coughs> Some a Muslim they fur from the celebration of birthday. Uh, some of them don't celebrate it, and, uh, but the day of their birthday, they may honor their mom, uh, and they may thank their mom, or they may fast, or may, they may thank God, but some of them, they may not go big deal and have a cake and have stuff. You know? And some of them, they say, you know what, it's, uh, I, didn't, I didn't do anything for, for like to, uh, I didn't do any, I was just born, and so, but I, uh, why should I celebrate it? Uh, like I didn't work hard for it, my mom did. <laughs> so they may give their mom. And this is why some Muslims, that they may not pay much attention to Mother's Day or Father's Day, because they say Mother's Day is, should be every day. You know, they celebrate Mother's Day every day. And uh, actually, there is a saying of the Prophet Muhammad that a guy came and asked him, oh, oh Prophet Muhammad, like, uh, what is the most beloved person that should be to me? And he said, your, uh, like, your mom. And then he said, who's next? He said, your mom. And said, who's next? And he said, your mom. And then the fourth time he said, and who's next? And then your father. So, <laughs> so if you are, you are unsure, ask. So new to observers of any religion or culture do this thing the same. So does your mom and mother-in-law do things the same on holidays? So something like, you always want to spend your holiday with your mom, uh, but not with your mother-in-law or, or future. That's how, how people uh, look at it. Uh, everyone appreciates attention. The way forward in cultural sensitivity and humility is to open a, dialo a dialogue, have a mutually respectful discussion, and ways to support one another. This is not to debate religion, culture, or politics. So this is not to judge one another choice. So, so this image is fine as it's meant to be a prophet and it's uh, intentionally vague. Uh, and atomically draw, correct drawing of people for healthcare or educational purpose is also okay. It is about the intention or purpose of the image. So this is the presentation I did uh, at the AOTA. How many of you went to AOTA in uh, Chicago? Oh no, okay. you have to go next year. <laughs> it's going to be great. So. In, uh, in some regions in America, like in Chicago, in Michigan, there is a large uh, population of Muslims and uh, students. So one of the professors in Michigan reached out to me, Sarah Clark, and she uh, uh, has student Muslims. And so some of the difficulties that we talked about is like time for prayer or fasting or whatever. Uh, so, and sh we did a poster and we presented it at the AOTA. And, uh, so we talked mainly of the stuff that we talked about, but uh, how to address, like if they work, if they have their field work in inpatient hospital or maybe outpatient. So like hand therapy, some of her students were from Saudi Arabia and then female to male are not allowed to touch. So, uh, so what she was, she was wearing gloves and then doing therapy in the patient with the gloves. It's considered okay, then there's a barrier between uh, the skins. And then in the school system, is uh, like uh, uh, sometimes it's uh, like a child may ask the, the, the why you have a headscarf on. So my wife she get asked us a lot so from her kids. Uh, she work in the school system, so my wife answer is, uh, well why you have the t-shirt on? <laughs> and then she say, well because I like it. And my wife she said I like it too. <laughs> so it just because you have to. You know, you cannot go explain it on to the little child. It'll be too much for them to grasp. So you have to be a little bit humor with it. <clears throat> so we have more commonalities than differences. This is actually an event I was uh, invited to uh, two weeks ago, and it's in uh, Revere in Massachusetts. And for some reason, they have a 50,000 population, but 5,000 of them are Moroccans. So it's a lot of you just kept moving there. Uh, so thank God they're not refugees. I mean, they are not, don't have, a, they all came uh, with the, some of them, uh, many of them are professionals, but they came with what they call lottery green card that the government gave each year. So, 
and we did an, uh, they did an iftar event for Ramadan, it's a happy Ramadan in the back, and they invited, uh, it's a rabbi, and this is a priest, and this is an imam, like a head of the mosque, and that's me. <laughs> So these are some of the resources, and thank you for the opportunity, and if you have any question, I will be happy to, to answer them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, I you know I will not go to an extent to I may do things that makes the patient comfortable to some extent, but I may not uh, compromise my own belief. Okay. For example, I will not sit with patient and drink alcohol with them because this is my own belief, or eat pork with them. So, yeah, yeah. Like uh, when, for example, some patient one time at the holiday they brought me a bottle of uh, wine. And I was like, well, I don't get, you know, I don't drink it I, anyway, like the holiday. So uh, that's, you know, I, I said, no, I don't drink it, and I don't give it, a, a ticket back. I don't want it. Good question. When you uh, work in Morocco and when you work in the United States, did you have to get two different types of certifications? Well, good question. And may I need some of you to help me with this in the future. <laughs> So we do not have OT in Morocco. So my goal is to bring OT to Morocco. Uh, so currently, I am in talk with some universities who are interested. And um, my doctorate degree was about creating OT in Morocco. So I created the curriculum and uh, based on the, what we just talked about, the religion, the culture, the social norms in that country. So the curriculum took those things, because you cannot take a 100% of the curriculum from the United States and teach it in America, in Morocco. So it has to be made or adapted for, for the society. So I did, I did not practice OT in Morocco. But I go, I was actually there two weeks, uh, th yeah, three weeks ago I was in Morocco, and uh, I still, I'm going uh, next week for six weeks, so I still go back and forth and volunteer there in clinics and hospitals and stuff. Uh, no, but I had people, women from, like from other, uh, that they are very conservative. Uh, I remember she was a Greek lady, she, because of a male. Thing, but not a Muslim thing. Yeah. But uh, a lot of people, a lot of old ladies, somehow they fell in love with me. <laughs> 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 I go inside the room and she's like, "Hi!" <laughs> oh my God! Yeah, like and was, one of them, she called the manager. She said, "I remember this like six, seven years ago. I want to work with him. I don't want to work with Nancy. I want to work with him." <laughs> I was like, "Oh, so." But um, as uh, Dr. Lucas mentioned, when I worked with children with autism for five years, we studied and we did a lot of um, applied behavior analysis. So I, we learned a lot how to convince children with autism how to even brush their teeth or uh, go put their shoes on or even just go to bed or whatever. So we, it helped me a lot in working with older adults because some of them have dementia, Alzheimer. So, and I used this technique to go so it's hard for me to get a no from a patient. I could convince them somehow. So, uh, Dr. Nafai, if you could just uh, talk a little bit about um, Gender differences and the and the because you talked about uh, the importance of mothers 
you talked about uh, modesty of, of wearing the hijab, but um, men actually are also uh, yeah, modest, the dress correct. is modest. So if you could say a little bit more about the, the roles and the understanding of the genders, yeah. um, I think that yeah, would be great. Thank you. So in a Muslim family, mainly the father is the head of the family. And uh, if an elder, uh, like we respect elders, like on a high level, so you may see somebody kissing somebody's hand or he's kissing somebody's head, uh, so we respect elders. And this can be sometimes an issue for, for treatment or therapy because you have a patient that just had a stroke and you're working with them to increase their hand movements and improve their self-feeling and stuff, but the kids, they say, it's my father, I have to help him, I have to do everything for him. So you teach them or you teach him how to feed himself and then they are feeding him, they are doing everything for him. So that's a, but men also have to have some modesty. So as I mentioned for the woman, it's the same, as I mentioned before, some men may not be comfortable like uh, uh, sitting very close next to you or maybe like uh, looking at you in the eye and talk to you. So, or maybe as I mentioned before, shaking your hand or, uh, uh, does that answer your question? Yes, and, and, and don't Muslim, most Muslim men also wear long sleeves and long pants? That yes. was true in, yeah. in, yes. Yeah, so like some of them, they may wear, they have to be under the knee. So like the uh, man should be wearing under the knee. Short, uh, short sleeve is okay, but these, they should not show their belly button, nor their, uh, their above their knee. Any question? Thank you for such an, a wonderful presentation. And I think what you have shared has gone a long way to break some of the stereotypes that, that people have about Muslims. What else would you like to see us do to continue to break the stereotypes and, and break this horrendous cycle where Muslims are so badly targeted um, at yeah. this point in history? Yeah, I think, I think just educating people. And social media has been great. I mean, a lot of people, uh, reaching through social media and saying, like, uh, stepping it. Now it's like a, it's called Islamophobia. So a lot of people are, you know, saying stuff against Muslims or Islam or, and uh, so actually the event I went to uh, uh, Revere last, uh, two weeks ago, actually the mayor was invited in there and he, he said it nicely. He said, you know what, this country has targeted other minorities before and now is it, uh, the time that they're doing it for Muslims, but we have to step on and say, step up and say no, that we, we don't allow this in our country. And it's, uh, unfortunately it happened to Jewish people here, it's happened to Irish people. It's, I mean, uh, one of the signs uh, he, he mentioned, it used to be in front of the stores, no Irish, no dogs, and no blacks uh, to enter the store, which is, but then uh, people look at it, it was okay. But you know, we should also step up and uh, not allow hatred, because uh, uh, hatred is, is affecting a lot of people. As I mentioned before, a lot of people are scared, are afraid. If you have a colleague, if you have a patient, or if you have a child of, uh, of a, or a Muslim family, you are going to feel this in them. People are getting, uh, you know, especially with the, you know, the, the election campaign going on now, banning Muslim, I don't want to mention names, but banning Muslims from coming to the country, or you know, we have to do this. We have to, you know, uh, like uh, target them, or we have to. So it can uh, can put a lot of anxiety on people. Question back. Hi there. So during the therapeutic relationship, if a, <laughs> if a misunderstanding has occurred and offense um, has been taken, you did mention apologizing. Just a simple apology might help, but how would you recommend approaching that apology? Like what, what, what do you, what, like exactly, can you tell me an example? Like, um, like, you, like with President Obama, um, with the, like if you have your feet up, oh, okay, and you yeah. some sort of yeah. misunderstanding so, yeah, has I mean, Yeah, like a, uh, uh, for example, if you go and you wanna shake somebody's hand, they didn't shake, and you know, uh, they say, I am sorry, I didn't know about it, and then they may educate you about it. Mm -hmm. Or, or if, for example, about the, the, the shoes thing, or you know, so you just have to, uh, uh, I mean, you just have to explain it uh, to them, and I mean, not necessarily apologizing if you want to, but if you want, you can. But you can just say, oh, sorry, this is, 
Because sometimes a lot of things in culture can be also what is normal here. You know, one thing I mentioned is, I forgot to mention, for example, burping, it's okay in, my con in uh, some co countries. Like the burp, like, 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 you think like an earthquake, <laughs> you know? <laughs> but uh, I mean, here it's, it's considered, so you may sit with somebody who is uh, from an uh, Islamic area, a country, Muslim country, and they may burp in front of you. Yeah, you go to, uh, like if you go to this or something, they may, it's okay with them. So uh, it's, it's it just, again, you just have to take it a nice way and try to uh, <laughs> bridge the gap. <laughs> yeah? Uh. <laughs> Getting my exercise in today. Very good. Um, so I know you uh, had a slide about uh, asking questions. So if, if you don't know, then ask. Do you have any examples of people who have respectfully asked you about your culture and your religion? Yeah, I have people who ask me. I mean, my religion, I'm proud of it, and I say I'm a Muslim. And uh, some, but again, this is a stereotype. I remember a guy who works with uh, 2006, 2007, and uh, it's like maybe the fifth session or sixth session. And then he asked me, and he said, yeah, I am. He said to me, oh, you are, like, are you from India? Or I said, no, I'm from Morocco. And I was like, oh, you're a Muslim? I said, yes. And then he said, wow. He said, I never thought I'm going to meet a nice Muslim like you. So, so and he starts, I said, you know, I, you know, I said, well, what makes you think that Muslims are bad? I said, why not? I just, we, that's, again, just hearing things, you know? And uh, a perfect example, actually, it's, uh, you may heard this in the news, like, it happened twice, about two or three months ago. A uh, family in the airplane, just they were talking Arabic, and the lady sitting next to them called uh, the, the flight uh, attendant, and they got kicked out of the airplane because they were talking Arabic, they said something, they're gonna do. And then another student was in the phone, and then, you know, how we say, God's willing, we say, inshallah, inshallah, God's willing. So she heard, inshallah, and then she, oh, he speaks Arabic. And then she uh, called the, and then he gets investigated by FBI and this, and then he gets sent in another airplane, so they found him clear. But I think I was traveling, I was uh, in March, I went to Colombia to attend the WFOT meeting, and, uh, while I'm in the airplane going from Boston to Miami, I was like trying to read a book in Arabic, and I was like, I'm not gonna do this. I don't wanna miss this flight. <laughs> and, uh, and the reason why, because somebody crazy sitting next to you, they may call, and then they just have to follow the protocol. Unfortunately, they have to follow the protocol. They have to get it out and get investigated, and then they're not, so I didn't do it. But going from Boston uh, two weeks ago, I, I flew, uh, to Boston, to uh, uh, Europe, and then to Morocco. I was reading, I was uh, talking in Arabic, I'm fine. And the reason why is because those people, that mainly people who fly from there, they're well, uh, not just educated, but it's well, they saw the world. They went outside the United States. They, t they met other people. Unfortunately, you may like people uh, who never even left their town, or maybe they left their states, those are the people who you get uh, sometimes problem with. Because they are not, they never may be met a Muslim, but they just hear the media, which is not, they are misrepresenting the Muslims. So then they'll get, they get to this misinterpretation because they heard the word in Arabic. And the funniest thing that happened again two weeks ago was a famous uh, scientist from Italy. He was jotting some, uh, did you hear this guys in the news? No? So a very famous uh, mathematician, like a scholar, he was jotting some information in the, in, the, uh, like a, in the paper, and the lady sitting next to him, and she thought he's writing Arabic. So she called, and he gets investigated. It was like, a, it was unbelievable. It was like, a, it was all over the news. And so it's, 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 it's part of what we call now Islamophobia. But I think uh, people like you can do great things, you know, by just, you know, spreading the message and and reaching to Muslims. Do you have any specific like hygiene um, related 
things that are different, um, like as far as deodorant um, or any sort of fragrance, any type of things like that? Um, you did everything that's uh, fragrant, uh, uh, perfume or, or deodorant, it's fine, everything. Yeah, but again, as I mentioned before, where the, before the prayer, they have the, to wash even their private part. So if you have an, somebody like uh, parts of stuff you can address in ADL, that'll be great too. Yeah, somebody, uh, uh, especially after stroke, that means it means a lot to them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> stereotypes um, what are the steps that should be taken um, you know to do that well unfortunately again you can right now what's going on they have to take everything serious I mean I don't blame them either but our people who are reporting that stuff they are going beyond the, the you know they are just like oh he, he said uh, you know he said oh Allah or he said that he wrote stuff in Arabic oh he must be a terrorist so I think this is this is it's not the people who they report it to them, they have to do their job. I don't blame them. They have to get you out of the airplane because they have to, what's happened, God forbid, if they did something. But I think, you know, the people are very paranoid and very... I guess what I'm trying to get at is yeah. like, if they don't have any, just by you speaking Arabic, that doesn't mean you're gonna do Exactly. Something. So they don't really have anything to say, excuse me, sir or ma'am, you have to come off the plane. So that, I guess that's what I'm trying to understand. Like, Unfortunately, how can you it's just happened. remove somebody yeah, I know. It's, it's, I, have, I don't think I have an answer for that, but unfortunately it's happened. It's happened. I mean, you can look at the news back two or three months ago. It's happened at least three, four times. I mean, here, but again, this is what I'm saying. It's only happened uh, national flights here in the United States. But mainly, again, like if you travel abroad, a lot of people are, they already have contacts with other people, so they, are, they don't think that way. So... Anybody? Yeah? You? Oh, you? Um, what direction do you see um, the Islamic faith going towards in the future? Like, um, uh, I know it's developed from what it was like maybe 100 years ago or where it's going now in the next, let's say, 20 years or something like that. Well, I mean, the faith should not change. Faith should be the same. And I think people may change a little bit and expect to be changed maybe a little bit more. But it's going in the rise. Uh, even in Europe, there's a lot of statistics that shows uh, in France, like in 2030, 2040, it's going to be 10% uh, or more of population there are Muslims and all other Arab Euro European countries. And uh, I mentioned, forgot to mention what's happened. Unfortunately, what's happened in Syria, it's a lot of refugees now. Are four and a half million to five million of Syrians are in Turkey. And then they are spread to other European countries. So Germany technically took one million Muslim Syrian refugee. refugee. So it's, Europe It's dealing now with, with, unfortunately, with Muslims that are refugees. So. It, both they have to adapt to uh, to to each other, you know. So it's it's going to, and even here, as I mentioned in the statistics, your chance to work with somebody Muslim or with your cli a patient or to be a Muslim, it has been increased because of the statistic. So it is expected to be two to three percent of the population in America are Muslims. Great. Thank you so much. Um, do you find that treating clients that are um, devout Muslims, do you find that to be, um, I guess, a, a challenge or just another factor? So sorry, lady? Uh, treating like someone that is a devout Muslim, like getting them back to their daily routines, do you find that to be a challenge or just a factor, like a client factor? Uh, well, it is a client factor. It's part of uh, who they are. But um, you just have to work. Again, it's just education. If you educate them, uh, I. <coughs> It's just not happened even, it's happened even in Morocco. So when I was in January, I was there with my wife and another professor, we were volunteering in a clinic. And one of the patients there has very devoted, uh, very conservative, like has a big beard and very, and uh, 
So I want to see him how he walks. And it's, I, I said, you know, he was wearing a big pants. Like, I said, hey, can you wear shorts? I want to see how to walk, you know? And then he said, no. I was like, what? And then, because there's two women there in the room. So I said, oh, okay. So I sent him out and I watched him. So it can happen even in, uh, in you know, in, even in Muslim country. And that's, sometimes they're maybe very conservative. And so you just take it as part of the, as a factor uh, to address, but not to, as a challenge. If you don't mind, can I just show this video for five or six minutes? All right, and then we'll, uh, let me find it. <clears throat> In the midst oh, and the no. aftermath of horrible incidents like the shooting in Orlando a week ago, we so often find extraordinary heroism and amazing grace. At Pulse nightclub, partiers turned into amateur medics, saving lives in the chaos. In Charleston, families of the victims face the shooter to somehow offer their forgiveness. Harry Smith has the story of the surprising awakening that came out of one shooting last year. Ted Hakey Jr. has admitted he had too much to drink that night. He'd been posting anti-Muslim messages on Facebook for months, and enraged by the scenes unfolding in France, he grabbed a gun, aimed next door, and pulled the trigger. The bullet came straight through the prayer hall, through the internal dividing wall, and out through the women's side as well. So it penetrated three walls. The Marine veteran was arrested and pled guilty to a hate crime. But in the months since, something remarkable happened. Would it be safe to say that you were guilty of stupidity? Absolutely, of course, of ignorance. Because if I had knocked on the door next door and realized that what they were all about, what even been a question? After the shooting, Hakey requested to meet with the mosque's leaders. He asked them for their forgiveness. It brought to discredit upon myself, the Marine Corps, everything I stand for, this just isn't me. And they did forgive him. To my congregation, I'm going to ask you to greet and meet and hug Mr. Hakey and Mrs. Hakey, just like a Muslim should treat his or her neighbor. The enemy next door became a friend. In fact, he became more than a friend. First he was a shooter, and then he was our neighbor, and then he was a friend, and he became my brother when he prayed with me side by side and bowed his head in prayer, and he didn't have to do that. A lot of the Muslims are very upset that their religion is being hijacked by people who don't follow the Quran, and that's what we need to realize, so that when you do see Muslims, you're not so, you know, uh-oh, stepping away. You need to just, you need to get educated, and, and, and the only way to beat this is with them on our side. Friday morning, Ted Hakey Jr. was in court to learn what sentence he'd receive for his crime. Also at the courthouse, members of the mosque he shot at. We were here to show our support and solidarity with Mr. Hakey, who's our new friend. They were there because they believe Hakey does not deserve jail time. This guy shot a gun at your congregation, but that, at your that, house of worship. But he was ignorant. But now that he knows, his heart has totally changed. And, you know, it's one person at a time, as we call it, one drop in the ocean, but, you know, 150 million to go, you know, so go we'll keep going. <laughs> Neither Hakey nor his neighbors had made any effort to become acquainted. They were strangers, content to be apart, and that, they acknowledge, was a mistake. Loving your neighbor is something that creates solace and tranquility in society and understanding. So you want to reach out to them to um, create that dialogue and to create that seed of love. We teach our children that oftentimes, the things they fear are simply unfamiliar. Hatred for Muslims, or hatred for gays, or hatred for anyone who seems to be something other than ourselves is based in that kind of fear. A fear of convenience. Because sometimes, it's just easier to hate than it is to find out who lives next door.
Swallow. And Harry Smith joins me now live. <laughs> a remarkable 180 turnaround for Ted Hakey. Is the remorse real? I just want to share this with you because there's a lot of people that just they don't know. And then they, they act a certain way, but unfortunately just because they don't know. Not because, most of them are not bad people, as you know, but they just act in a different way but because uh, they don't know, unfortunately. Any questions? One more question and then it's Sorry, one more, one more question. Um, as a Muslim, are you likely to advocate for yourself if a uh, practitioner, if there is a woman in the room and you don't feel comfortable, or if a time doesn't, um, scheduling time conflicts with a prayer time, are people practicing Muslim faith likely to advocate for that? As a practitioner? Um, or, or as a patient. Uh, if they yeah, feel yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, like for example, in Saudi Arabia or Kuwait, where that's very strict, they have female treats female and male treats male. Okay. So it's very already a set, set stone. So just avoid things like that. Mm -hmm. So they would, they would likely say, oh, I pray during this time, I don't want to schedule something there, or would yeah, they yeah, just like, not show up? Yes, no, they will tell, they will tell you. Okay. If they are practicing 100%, they will tell you, uh, I don't want that time because they pray during that time to the uh, Friday prayer, mm -hmm. so they will uh, not schedule the appointment. Okay, thank you. All righty, thank you so much, Dr. Nefei. Let's give him a warm round of applause. Thank you, thank you very yes, much. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you.